I'm here with former uh, State Police Minister and Minister for Hunter and the Central Coast, Mick Gallagher, who um, resigned from Parliament in 2017 following allegations that were made against him uh, in an ICAC investigation in 2014, um, which have now been declared to be unsubstantiated. Um, Mick, thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, for those uh, viewers who aren't quite aware of it, can you take us back to 2014 and just tell us exactly what happened in that ICAC investigation? Yeah, well, look, on that day, um, I was down at the New South Wales Police Academy doing probably one of the most solemn, uh, at one of the most solemn occasions, and that's a swearing-in ceremony for young police when I found out that uh, uh, about an hour and a half beforehand, uh, I had been accused of being in a corrupt relationship at the ICAC. Of course, completely dumbfounded by this allegation, astounded by it, shocked by it. Uh, it wasn't until I got back to Sydney that I fully understand, understood the ramifications of it all. And uh, within a very short period of time, I was forced to resign uh, my position, my commission as uh, minister, as well as uh, the deputy vice president of the executive council. And there commenced a, a roller coaster ride that uh, I wouldn't like to see anyone have to go through. And this, despite the fact that there was no evidence presented against you at this, it was a, it was a, a, an off the hand allegation made by counsel in ex, in uh, um, cross examining a, a, a witness, an independent witness, and he and your name just came up, accused of being involved in this this scam to yeah. to conceal political donations and so on. And you, of course, had nothing to do with it. Yeah. I was the one that was told that uh, through the public hearing and this uh, revelation that I had created this corrupt scheme, uh, which was news to me. And uh, of course, the other situation that occurs is once uh, the corruption word is used against you, it really is just political death. The sad thing, of course, was that there was no evidence put to me to substantiate the claim, nor was an allegation even put to me in that regard when I eventually gave evidence later. But of course, in the last week, we now know that the inspector has reviewed the evidence. The inspector is the oversight body for the ICAC, the policeman, if you like, for yep. the ICAC, yep. and come to the conclusion, thankfully, that there was insufficient evidence for them to even make that claim. But um, it's cold consolation after having been forced to resign from the cabinet and then sit as a crossbencher for almost three years. Yeah. Um, and as you were saying, that in itself was a humiliating experience. Well, it was. I mean, I had been leader in the Legislative Council for 15 years. So uh, to find myself sitting on the crossbench for what I thought was going to be a very short time before I was cleared, I was confident I'd be cleared to come back, uh, but not expecting it to drag on for years. Um, it was humiliating. Um, but the longer it went, I suppose the stronger and more determined I came that I came to the view that I was going to see this out. I was actually going to stay there and tough it out because I wanted to see justice. It moved very slowly. Um, the report that came out uh, glossed over, in fact, forget, forgot to even mention the corruption reference to me, uh, but it still hung there in the air. Uh, and that's why I'm so grateful that the inspector all this time afterwards took time to go through and look at the evidence and make that announcement at the parliamentary hearing uh, only a week and a half ago just in terms of there being any lack of evidence to support that claim. Yeah, it must have been a dark time for your family in those intervening years. Yeah, it was really tough. Um, it really was. Uh, we had a lot of personal issues happening at the time. My wife was quite ill and it impacted uh, that coupled her, her illness plus this um, constant uh, pressure of this inquiry uh, really impacted on quite a number of my family members in a very difficult time. I think one of the biggest challenges for us is we've lived on the coast here for a long, long time. I think we're well and truly qualified as locals. Mm. And um, you know a lot of people, having been a senior police officer up here for many years, I've known a lot of people over the years and they've known me in that policing role and then they've known me in the parliamentary role you sort of feel like you want to walk down the wrong side of the road in the shadows for people not to see you when these allegations are made because despite the fact that you know you're innocent, there's always that question in their mind, this has been said at an inquiry, surely it must be true, surely there must be evidence to back it up. Yeah. There was no evidence to back it up. Once that word said, corruption, it's very hard then yeah. to get rid of that association, yeah. even though it's been found that you were you didn't act corruptly at all and weren't even involved. It's a smear that sticks. Yeah. yeah. Um, for those people who want to believe it, they will always believe it anyway. 
Um, but those that had lingering doubts, I'm so glad now that the inspector's words would have, in my mind, and I'm sure in theirs, satisfied any doubt that they had uh, that what happened there was wrong. Mm. Uh, and I'm very happy for it now being in the public uh, arena, particularly here on the coast. And I'm grateful to you uh, and your publication for giving me an opportunity to uh, make sure Central Coast people know that I didn't let them down. Yeah, it's very important that that message gets out there. And you were saying to me also that um, in those difficult years, your membership at Terrigal Surf Life Saving Club, there was a bit of a lifeline for you and your wife. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. The moment you put the sunnies and the cap on <laughs> yeah. and the uniform, you get anonymity. Yeah. And we found that we could go down to the beach and be part of the normal community again. But there wasn't a bullseye painted on you. And when you were rescuing people or attending to people on the beach for a blue bottle sting or whatever it was, they didn't care who you were. Mm -hmm. They just saw the red and yellows coming to their resistance. So the members of our club were great. Uh, they knew me and they didn't believe it and they backed me and mm -hmm. that really did help us. It helped my wife through the situation that she was going through with her health mm -hmm. to know that there were people there supportive of us as a family and uh, that really did go a long way. Oh, that's good news at least. Yeah. So how did you feel then when McClintock's comments were made public? Well, it's that old situation, you know, you know the truth mm -hmm. and you can shout it from the top of the hills, but not everyone can hear it. But it's when somebody like um, Bruce McClintock, who is one of the nation's most respected legal minds, um, who took time to look at it, when he makes the claim, then that does stop uh, a lot of people and cause them to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, the sad reflection, of course, is that at the time in 2014, my reputation was torn to pieces, not just here on the coast, not around the nation, not just, internationally as well. Mm. It made international news. Sadly, uh, Mr McClintock's revelations last week didn't quite secure the same level of media coverage. So again, I'm grateful to you guys for recognising this is a good, valuable story for the coast. It is a good story. Um, because it does restore people's faith that you know, members of parliament are in there doing the right thing uh, and I was one of them. You've heard nothing in the way of an apology as yet from the government in the wake of this? Yeah, look, and I haven't expressly asked for an apology because I don't want to get caught up in this, well, who was to blame to make the apology. Mm. What I'm more after from the government is an acknowledgement. Uh, a lot of what happened to me was debated publicly through my position in Parliament. Mm -hmm. It was recognised because of my position. The former Premier's comments uh, were made in connection with my role in Parliament, stepping down. Therefore, what I'm asking is that there be some recognition in the Parliament, in the Legislative Assembly, uh, by the leadership, uh, recognising firstly the inspector's comments and the gravity of those comments in regards to the conduct of the questioning and my treatment, but then also recognising the wrong that was occasioned upon me um, and an appreciation, I suppose, of the years that I've had to wait patiently for this thing to be cleared. Mm. I think if it's worthy of the debate at the start to be raised in the House and for the then Premier to express his view, I think it's only worthy that now that this is now being cleared, that the current Premier, uh, she have an opportunity to express her um, concerns about my treatment and also recognise the comments of the inspector. It will be interesting to see if that's forthcoming. In the meantime... Hope springs a term. Yeah. <laughs> in the meantime, ICAC itself had a major overhaul in 2015 <clears throat> following concerns from the High Court that the system wasn't quite working the way it should. And even now there are some concerns that, these, that claims can be made in the ICAC investigations and people aren't even given the chance to defend themselves against such claims. What's your feeling about ICAC's role now? Do you feel it still needs some work? I think we've outgrown what we currently see as the concept of a public hearing. The public hearings of the 1980s, late 80s, uh, when uh, um, Premier Griner, uh, to Gary with, uh, together with Gary Sturgis and others, created the ICAC, thought that the public hearing would be a, a good measure of um, ensuring people understood the ramifications of corruption, to use it as a deterrent. But of course since then it's evolved and it's more than just uh, a hearing where people make allegations. It's being broadcast live through social media and across the media and of course in 1988-89, when it was created, there was no internet, there was no Google search engines. And of course, 
it did give people an opportunity if an allegation was made and it was found to be not substantiated for them to get on with their lives. And I think sometimes I've even heard some of the commissioners even say to give people an opportunity to get on with their lives. The reality is that albatross that hangs around your neck called the internet doesn't allow you to get on with your life and it never will. Your name and the allegations that are made against you are there in perpetuity. Therefore, it's my view now that we need to rethink this whole concept of a public hearing. Uh, I think there is a, an opportunity for a fresh approach. Sure, there is an opportunity for there to be some uh, public announcements with regards to uh, corruptions and inquiries. But putting allegations to people as if they were gospel and then having them played around the nation's media, if not the world's, depending on who the person is, I don't think that's what justice is. And I think people need to have a look at it themselves and say, what if it were me? How would I feel about it? We need to have measures to fight corruption. I've always said that. I've believed in it and I've actually been part of it, uh, part of that fight against corruption in my previous role in policing. But at the same time, I also recognise the importance of making sure they get it right and mm. respecting the reputations and the damage that can be occasioned to people. We cannot have state-sponsored defamation. A point well made. Well, it remains to be seen whether <coughs> the uh, issue will be acknowledged in, in state parliament. We'll certainly keep our eye on that. And for now, we thank Mike Gallagher for joining us. Thank you so much, Mike, for your time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity.